Good morning and a very warm welcome to you all to this, our Cranmer Group virtual service on the first Sunday after Trinity, Sunday the 14th of June. A very warm welcome from me, the Reverend Tim Chambers. I'm the vicar of the Cranmer Group of Churches, if you don't already know me. We also have some news for you this morning. I don't know whether you may have seen in the press that uh, churches, places of worship, are able to open for private prayer from now on under certain circumstances, under the government's uh, social distancing and hygiene guidelines. We are delighted to be able to participate in that and so we are opening our churches on a rotor basis throughout our six villages throughout this coming week and every week starting on the 15th, Monday the 15th of June. Details of uh, which churches are open when will be at the end of this video, end of this video service. They're also available on our website and will be on posters, uh, publicity posters around your villages as well. So do please come along to our church buildings. They are special places. Come and pray with us in private prayer, in quiet at those times. We'll be delighted to welcome you back. As we start our service this morning, let's just take a moment of quiet. The Lord be with you and also with you. I'll lead us in the collect for today from common worship. God of truth, help us to keep your law of love and to walk in ways of wisdom that we may find true life in Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Deb Hubbard is going to lead us in our first hymn this morning, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Deb. Roger Coulter is now going to share with us the reading for this morning. The reading is Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 8. 
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone possibly might dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us all in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Here endeth the reading. Thank you, Roger, for reading to us. Lord, I pray that you will be in my words and in our hearts and minds this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. In my first year of vicar school, as we used to call it, I recall, rather embarrassedly, being at the start of a lecture on St Paul's letter to the Romans. Our tutor strode into the classroom, put his papers on his lectern, and as he gathered his thoughts, he turned to us. And he said, turn to your neighbour. Ask them what is so important to them about St Paul's letter to the Romans. That Monday, I happened to be sitting next to one of my good friends um, who uh, it turned out uh, was the uh, was the uh, most academic in our cohort by the end of the third year. She came top of our class and she proceeded to gush at great length about how important St Paul's epistle to the Romans was to her personal faith and also to her journey towards ordination. If you're sitting at home now thinking, I'm not really sure what I think about the book of Romans. To be honest, I don't think I've ever really looked at it that much. And I certainly couldn't say hand on heart that it is fundamental to why I'm a Christian. I know where you're coming from. That was me in my first year class in that lecture room that morning. Fortunately, Sarah's boundless enthusiasm for Romans carried us virtually to the moment when our lecture, lecturer called us to order again. So my mumblings uh, weren't too obviously superficial. But I still recall pretty clearly the feeling of, oh my goodness, this is going to be really embarrassing that I felt when the question was first posed to us. I wonder what all of you might say if I were to ask the same question of you this morning. The good thing is that you too, having heard my confession, can make exactly the same sort of response as I did and not feel embarrassed about it. Since the fellow who's now your vicar did that too and not too many years ago either. So I hope you'll be glad to know, A, that I'm now really rather more familiar with St Paul's letter to the Romans than I was then. And B, I do believe that what St Paul says about the Christian faith in these 16 chapters can radically change our understanding of what being a Christian is all about and especially of what God has done for us in the person of Jesus Christ. What that means for our Christian faith and how that really helps it to make sense. 
We're going to be following the lectionary readings over the coming few Sundays uh, through uh, the letter to the Romans and delving a bit deeper into what makes it so central to the faith of very many Christians. But if you also happen to be watching this film and you wouldn't consider yourself to be a Christian, perhaps um, you may have a friend who suggested that you come and have a look at our Cranmer Group videos, uh, our services. Or maybe you've even just stumbled across this film online. If that's you, I hope you too will hear something from St Paul's letter, from his words and from them sense God inviting you to enter into a relationship with him, based on a love that's certainly beyond our human practice, and quite possibly beyond our human comprehension. The message of St Paul's epistle to the Romans has in fact been fundamental to the faith of a number of extremely important Christians. Martin Luther, the German monk who sparked the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, saw in Romans the justification by faith, the reconciliation with God through our personal faith in him alone, that was the foundation stone of that split from the Roman Catholic Church and the establishment of a whole new pattern of theological thought and church practice. And famously too, the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley, on hearing a London preacher expound on Luther's commentary on the letter to the Romans, he felt his heart strangely warmed as he wrote. Something stirred deep within him, that full acceptance in Christ, God's grace, that full acceptance, was available to him. And from that point on, he travelled the length and the breadth of England, spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And tens of thousands of people came to faith through him. So what is this good news, this gospel that we read in Paul's letter to these early Roman Christians? and which has had such a profound effect, whether directly or indirectly, on the faith and life of so many people. The first thing that we see from today's passage is the absolute centrality of Christ to our relationship with God. The God who created us wants nothing more than that we live our lives in relationship with him. Our Heavenly Father aches for us to turn away from all the false gods, if you like, with which we're surrounded in our lives. Idols that seek to make us more dependent on them and which draw us away from the intimacy with him, with God, for which every man, woman and child is created. Idols like capitalism. Idols like materialism, like cynicism, communism, maybe atheism, agnosticism, any ism you care to mention, all idols that serve to draw us away from relationship with God if we allow them to do so. And the way in which this connection with God that we're all created for this reconnection with God comes about is in the person of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, God's only son, who willingly out of pure love for humanity came to this earth to be sacrificed for us on the cross, only to defeat death and rise again on the third day. Even though humanity turns away from God, even though each one of us, no matter how good we may be in human terms, does things that constantly grieve God's heart. Even with all of this, Jesus came to earth to die an agonising death that you and I might be reconciled once again with God. 
So first, our reading tells us of this centrality of Christ to our faith. Second, it tells us of the sufficiency of our Saviour. Paul expands greatly on this theme elsewhere. But even in this passage, where it's still not completely front and centre of what he's saying, it's still absolutely clear that it's not through living a good life, commendable though that is, and as much as it gladdens God's heart when we do so, it's not through living a good life that we come back into this place of intimacy with our Heavenly Father. Jesus has done on the cross all that is necessary, all that is sufficient. All we have to do is receive him into our lives and believe and trust in him as our Lord and Saviour. And in doing so, we'll receive through him, as Paul says in verse 1, peace once again with our Creator. So first, our reading tells us of the centrality of Christ. Second, it tells us of the sufficiency of our Saviour. And third, it tells us of the generosity of God's grace. We can enter again into right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Christ, who, as verse 8 of our reading says, died for us while we were still sinners. At the heart of the gospel is this extraordinary message that God, for all that we do that grieves him, for all that we turn away from him, for all that we continue to do wrong towards him, for all that we continue to do wrong to those around us. God still extends his arms of loving welcome to us in and through the person of Jesus Christ. God's grace cannot be earned. God's grace is freely given to us all. And God's grace knows no limits. As the Christian author Philip Yancey writes, there is nothing that we can do to make God love us more. And there is nothing that we can do to make God love us less. Think about it a bit. This truly is amazing grace. Amazing grace which enables us, in Paul's words, to boast in the hope of the glory of God. These last few days have seen across the world huge protests against specific and systemic injustices, especially racial injustices, both historical and present. I believe it's right, as our archbishops and bishops, Bishop Paul included, have publicly said, that as British Christians, we acknowledge we have been part of a society and indeed of a church, which have not done enough to create a just, equitable and compassionate society. A just equitable and compassionate country and world for all men, all women and all children. We have much on which to reflect and I believe we have much of which we need to repent as well. But we also live in the certainty of the gospel that Christ came to earth, that we might be saved, that in him all that's necessary for salvation has already been achieved, and that in him the boundless generosity of our all-loving God comes alive for us all. 
we are each made by him, in his image. No one, no matter what we may have done, no one is excluded from receiving his unearnable grace and in so receiving, being brought back into relationship with him, our Heavenly Father. May we all, no matter how well, or not, we may know St Paul's letter to the Romans, no matter how much, or not, we may say that it's been significant in our journey of faith up to this point. May we at least take this from this morning. Remember the centrality of Christ, the sufficiency of our Saviour and the generosity of God's grace. And as we continue to explore this epistle over the weeks to come, I pray that God's word in this letter will do a work in your heart so that in time you too will feel able to say just how important Romans has been in your personal journey of faith. In Jesus' name I pray this. Amen. Annie Dickinson is now going to lead us in our intercessions. Thank you, Annie. Let us pray. And when I say, Lord, by your grace, I invite you to respond, may thy kingdom come. Lord, by your grace, may thy kingdom come. As we join together in prayer, let's remember and reflect on the nature of our God. Knowing that God is able to perform even what seems to us impossible. And remembering that he has demonstrated his power and his authority to us in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we reflect on the nature of God our Father, his power, his passion and his unchangeable promises to mankind, let us pray for his world. We pray for his church throughout the world, remembering that in doing so, we're not merely lifting up to him a community or a building or a denomination, but we're praying for each and every human being across the world who seeks his face, who clings to his love for them, who looks to Jesus Christ for their hope and who longs for God's justice and God's mercy to be made real in the lives of all people. Lord, by your grace, may thy kingdom come. We pray for ourselves and for each other. Father God, where we know fear, Replace it with your peace. Father, where we feel lonely or isolated, replace it with the knowledge of your presence and your love for each one of us. And Father, where we feel doubt, replace it with confidence in your promises made to each one of us through Jesus Christ. Lord, give us compassionate hearts, give us listening ears, give us generous spirits. Lord, by your grace, may thy kingdom come. We pray for the broken, for those experiencing persecution, for those who feel unloved, or unvalued. We pray for the homeless, those who feel lost. 
and we pray especially this week for those caught up in conflict by racial division. Let us take a moment to remember why Jesus died for us. So that, to take a phrase from Martin Luther King, peace and brotherhood may become a reality. So let us remember that in God, all lives matter. To God, all his children are sacred. And so, Father, we ask you to help all of us to bring peace and reconciliation wherever we find anger or conflict or fear. And we pray for a spirit of peace and reconciliation to surround and fill all those who currently feel division and anger and resentment. Lord, open my eyes that I may see the needs of others. Open my ears that I may hear their cries. Open my heart so that they may not need to be without help or support. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Lord, by your grace, may thy kingdom come. Amen. Thank you, Annie. I'll now lead us in the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I'll lead us in the collect for today from the Book of Common Prayer. O God, the strength of all them that put their trust in thee, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without thee, grant us the help of thy grace, that in keeping of thy commandments, we may please thee both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Deborah Davis is now going to lead us in our closing hymn, All My Hope on God is Founded. Thank you, Deborah.
Thank you, Deborah. A quick reminder to those of you who are watching this service on Sunday morning, we will be convening as usual on Zoom at 10.15. Do please join us for that gathering with all the other members of our church family. Details of how to get onto the Zoom gathering are on the church website. I'll bring our service to a close with a blessing. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you and those you love always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Go well, be blessed, have a good week and see you in 15 minutes.